appearance is skyrocketing. We've seen a 150% surge in anti-Asian American hate crimes in major cities, including an 81-year-old woman being punched in the face and lit on fire outside her own home, a 61-year-old man being slashed in the face with a box cutter on the subway in New York City, a woman being doused in the face with a burning toxic chemical as she took out the trash at her home, and a 15-year-old boy being hospitalized uh, after being attacked at school by a bully assailant who claimed he had COVID-19 because he was Asian. Um, the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, whose wife Yumi is Korean American, um, told me uh, in a phone conversation yesterday that he uh, and his wife and his daughter's closest friends have all been affected by the new wave of hostility against the AAPI community. Governor Hogan told me that close family friends have been assaulted in a convenience store, screamed at by racists telling them to go back to China, and told that they did not want to sit next to them on an airplane because they were Asian and had COVID. There's no free speech defense to commission of violent assaults on Asian Americans or anybody else. And the bizarre invocation of free speech in this context is a dangerous and irrelevant distraction from the violence engulfing AAPI communities across the land. We've got Korean American and Japanese American and Vietnamese American constituents who've been attacked by racist fanatics screaming about the Wuhan flu. So just consider the leaps of uh, illogic and fallacy which lead to this kind of crime. First, you've got to blame the COVID-19 uh, virus on the Chinese government or the Chai comms, as the ranking member proudly uh, puts it, an authoritarian government which President Trump lavishly praised 37 different times in the first three months of COVID-19 for its excellent response. Then you've got to blame the lethal recklessness of President Trump, who said COVID-19 would magically disappear by Easter and suggested injecting bleach is a miracle cure and refused to develop any nationwide plan to crush the virus um, on the Chinese government and on the Chinese people. Then you've got to associate the alleged policy errors of the Chinese government with the Chinese people. Then you must associate the Chinese people with Chinese American citizens of the United States. Then you must associate Chinese American citizens with Korean Americans, Vietnamese Americans, and so on. Then you must assume that all of your misguided and fallacious views justify violent attacks on Asian American strangers. And all of these fallacies and lies are built on assumptions of collective guilt, mass punishment, and vigilante justice that are completely at odds with our constitutional values. So it's remarkable to me that when we try to put a stop to this deranged violence, we have colleagues who think it's irrelevant or productive to defend Donald Trump's totally unmolested First Amendment rights to blame his own failures on the Chinese government, which he enthusiastically praised 37 different times. So Mr. Yang, is the invocation of free speech relevant or constructive to the dialogue about anti-Asian American violence and racism today? Thank you for that question. And thank you very much for expressing the powerful words that you do. Free speech is not a defense of the system. You, we have no free speech right to yell fire in a crowded theater. And what is happening right now is the Asian Americans are in a crowded theater where we are being endangered. The other point is, regardless of free speech, all of us as leaders have an obligation to model behavior that we want our community to follow and model behavior that would lift our entire country up instead of trying to be divisive and make individuals or communities targets of hate when it is unnecessary. The last thing that I would say is, as has been established by previous speakers, everyone agrees there is no medical benefit to using terms such as China virus and Wuhan flu. And everyone agrees that there is some effect, and you could debate how much, but there is an effect on the hate that the Asian American community has received. So the cost benefit analysis is clear. The cost to the community, Asian American community of calling the terms that it is, is great. The benefit of not using, uh, the benefit of using these terms is nil. So in that Thank sense, you. it makes no sense. Thank you so much. And uh, Professor Lee, um, would you agree that it is um, dangerous and irrational to conflate the question of random vigilante attacks and violence on American citizens with questions of foreign policy and the behavior of foreign governments? Yeah, thank you for that great question. It is irrational. 
but it has been part of our historical record. And we have seen where that hate has led. There has been too many times when Japanese Americans, for example, had been conflated with the Japanese enemy. This is one of the ways in which American racism works. Uh, we think we should have learned this lesson by now in the 21st century, that as all of the fellow witnesses have, have reiterated, a point that really <laughs> should not need to be made in the first place, we are Americans. We are Americans of Asian descent. We are proud of that ancestry and heritage, but conflating us with a, uh, with a foreign government has been an age old way of denigrating us, separating us, making us other. Um, and that has led to racism in the past and it's leading to racism today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this great hearing and I yield back to you. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. This, this is a problem that we